Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, uh, good evening, all the participants from uh, Asia and Pacific uh, time zone, and also good afternoon, Patrick uh, from London. Welcome back. This is the fourth lecture for the, uh, the Doctor Consortium from Patrick Schumann. Uh, to, today, the lecture uh, topic is uh, the most important, I think, uh, architecture styles, which uh, Patrick put forward uh, several years ago. And uh, uh, in the academic world, a lot of discussion on that. So looking forward, uh, Patrick um, can analyze and introduce uh, his architecture uh, style uh, from um, um, uh, Patrick's understanding. So uh, I think uh, he briefly analyzed uh, the uh, the outline of the topic, including the rationality of phenomenon and concept of styles and styles as necessary uh, necessary programs of architecture and style regulate both form and function. Architecture progress as a uh, progression of styles. Styles as uh, design research programs, historical alignment of uh, epical styles. And epical uh, sub subsidiary and uh, transitional styles. So I think this, the, the keywords uh, which put forward as the, the main um, uh, topic uh, and the main, uh, and, uh, I think, uh, which is a framework of today. So looking forward, uh, Patrick, and uh, give interesting uh, lecture tonight. Thank you. Let's welcome give screen to Patrick. Yeah, thanks again for letting me speak. One of my favorite <laughs> topics, <laughs> um, architectural styles and the theory of styles. And it's been a little bit controversial. So let's see if I can convince some of you. Um, let me share my screen first of all, because I have some text slides again. Mm -hmm. uh, wait one moment. Okay. And right. So it's architectural okay. styles, so maybe it's a theory of architectural styles. In this case, I'm going to show my, many visuals. There are mm -hmm. a few in this lecture, but very, very sparsely at, towards the end. <clears throat> yeah, so it's been a controversial concept. It's a very much better dismissed concepts over the years, but it keeps coming back. Um, it has a certain survival capacity as a concept, uh, but whenever it's been raised, it's been controversial. We discussed yesterday, hinted at the, maybe people don't like to be labeled, they don't like to be um, explicitly fixed within a certain set of uh, repertoires and values and ways of working, although implicitly everybody always is. And so what my task has been not to prescribe, my task has been to make explicit what was already uh, without exception, implicitly followed, adhered to, uh, both in terms of output and critique by a whole generation of architects. And I've done that 10 years after, for instance, with respect to Parmatism, 10 years after I've observed a totally consistent pattern of work and evaluation. Uh, so I'm making that explicit and open it up to critique, not, I thought uh, the, the critique shouldn't hit the messenger like it often does. The critique could maybe hit the substance um, you know, of, of the particulars of what I've proposed rather than a kind of gut reaction against any proposal of a, a style. So that, that's what I've been battling with, uh, prim primarily, you know, from the, uh, the group of protagonists, I've been trying to uh, describe their work, our work, etc. So yeah, you've just uh, noted some of these concepts. I mean, in general, with respect to the um, discourse analysis of the function system of architecture, or communication system of architecture, I've been focusing in on trying to explain the rationality of the categories. And the category of style is certainly one of those 
which I think do have does have a lot of rationality in terms of making a making important distinction historically, but also important options and distinctions with respect to how to get forward. Basically, what we need to do, we need to choose a style of paradigm. Um, and I will also argue that there is, in fact, whether you want to admit to it or not, no architecture, no um, designer or design firm without operating a style. So style is, uh, if it's not explicitly pursued and declared, it certainly underpins as a set of limitations and constraints and preferences and particular ways of working, which every architect and group of architects, if they're, if they're operating similarly, uh, are working within and under. And if they want to pretend that they're unconstrained and unlimited, I think that's just that, a pretense. Um, but also I wanted to point, point three, styles regulate both form and function. I think that's very important. And that's been rarely made explicit, but it is clear when you look at the actual work and ways of working, the methodologies and ways of working, which I describe as working within a particular style, they also include ways of appreciating, understanding and interpreting the brief, a way of understanding the program and the social functionality that has to be addressed. So that changes from epoch to epoch, that changes from style to style. Those, um, thing, those, those things matter a lot and I have also um, therefore in my description and the particular elaboration of the style of, for instance, of parametrism in contrast to, for instance, modernism, I'm focusing also on what I call the functional heuristics of the style, and I will come to that. Very important is that architectural progress is moving through a progression of styles from style to style, but of course also there is progress within a style that shouldn't be forgotten. There's cumulative progress within a style, within a paradigm, but then there is ma the major adaptations to new external conditions or conditions of technology and the means of addressing external conditions, those changes often agenda or allow for and make given opportunity to also shift from one style to another. And these are big leaps forward uh, from one paradigm to the next. So that's the way in the long arc of history, you can chart progress within architecture as the progression of styles, again, important to say that within each style you can see the progression so if you look at modernism which is running for let's say 70 years or the early modernism pre-modernism uh, works of the 1910s let's say uh you know uh, compare those to the to the mature refined and large-scale works of the 1960s of course there's a lot of progress it's all modernism there's a lot of progress within each style but it's also important to see that then there's limitations to what, how much further you can progress. There's an element of exhaustion, but more importantly, there's an element of maybe of fundamental maladaptiveness of the paradigm, the style with respect to historical conditions. If they move on, you have to leap and society leaps forward with a, also with an uneven development with cumulative versus revolutionary periods, if there's a, a dramatic transformation of society through new technologies and social dynamics, a let's say a leap forward, a big step of progress in society, then architecture has to follow this. And the only way to follow this is through a shift in the paradigm or style. So 
Okay. Um, now I want to build up to the way the concept of style is located in particular within the discourse analysis I'm giving of the discipline of architecture. I want to locate it within the system of categories um, of our field. And that means I'm starting with the lead distinction of our field. So architecture's autopoiesis or the discourse of architecture fundamentally is fundamentally structured by its lead distinctions. Now, and I will make a comparison uh, of the function system of architecture with a series of other function systems. So you can see that the concept of lead distinction is a broader concept. There's not only that architecture has a lead distinction, that other major professions and discourses or function systems have lead distinctions too. So our lead distinction is form versus functions. And you probably recognize it. So uh, you know, obviously my theory of architecture is trying to represent first of all and trace what's going on, what are the categories which are high, which are you know hugely prominent. And of course, that debate between form and function is coming up in every project, every crit. You know, we had big historical debates about the idea of form follows function whether that is, is workable, is, is, is correct, is true. Uh, the, you know, the attempts to dismiss form and try to see, think that, that an architectural discourse could, should focus on function only and, and form is trivial. I mean, we have so many debates about it. It remains an indispensable distinction and set of categories. And basically um, it is, we can recognize architecture and by the way i'm saying the, the, the all the design disciplines so everything which was taught at the bauhaus or everything zadid architects are doing is revolving around that distinction and you can recognize whether something belongs into the discourse and discipline of architecture uh, namely if it is addressing this tension or relationship and distinction if it works with this distinction or not if it doesn't work with this distinction uh, it's then it talks about other things, meaning it doesn't talk architecture. So, but what is interesting to see, so the fundamental theory of um, functionally differentiated society, which is this based on works with this concept of, and that's coming out of systems theory in general, there's this idea of systems operating within environments. So the system environment distinction is fundamental. And uh, what that means, the system is a particular system of communications where there's a flow of communication which could be written, oral, artifacts and visual, uh, which, is, which is internally strongly connected and self-referential. So the, all these communications refer to each other, use, build on the same categories, use similar types of arguments. So that's the system. And the system exists in an environment, and the environment, most importantly, is the societal environment, the rest of society. The other parts of society, which talk about different things, have different concerns. There are other networks of communication, uh, which are internally connected, but, but not so much connected directly into architecture. I mean, it's not that there's a matter closure, but let's say system environment. The environment also includes the out external pressures let's say nature the planet etc that's also the environment but the most important immediate environment is the rest of society talking about other things doing other things so this so so the system environment distinction is fundamental to all function systems because we are differentiating out a particular function system against the the environment in which it sits and to which it contributes and an environment which this system observes the environment to, to identify problems and also to develop solutions for the rest of society. So that is a very important distinction. And what I'm saying here is that the lead distinction, and that's something where you can pick out in Luhmann, but I sort of systematize it. In some sense, I'm drawing everything from Luhmann, but also 
systematizing a lot of Luhmann's work and, and, and make these comparisons he's doing between the different function system. I systematize them further with that big tableau I was showing the other day and I'll show, show it again today. So the, the thing here is that what Luhmann talks about is the re-entry of the system environment distinctions into the system. So we have a system which talks about the environment and then it, there is certain categories which reflect that distinction inside the discourse itself. And in this case, it is the lead distinctions, which is always some kind of particular mirror image of the system environment distinction. So basically the, the side of form is basically the internal reference or self-reference within the system, because we are actually in charge of the form and the function, the concept of function within the discourse of architecture is basically the external reference the world reference, as Luhmann also calls it, meaning through discussing function, we're discussing challenges and problems coming from outside of uh, our discourse. So that's the external reference. So that's the way the, form, the lead distinction copies into it the system, the system environment distinction. And what's also important about lead distinctions, basically with the categories of elite distinctions, you can formulate in one sentence, the task of all design disciplines, of architecture. Basically, it means giving form to function. And I emphasize here giving form to social function rather than technical function. So, so that's this idea of the lead distinction. I will come to, I mean, I'm building this up. I will talk about style because we're coming to that, how style then becomes an important element uh, following on from this. But before we go there, I want to show that in the systematization of these comparisons, so yesterday I was talking about the legal system, the economic system, et cetera, particularly when I was talking the legal system, the political system, their important influences on architecture, but most, the, the most importantly, I refer to these as separate function systems and discourses just for the sake of comparison and not necessarily discussing the influences between them so much as saying, let's look at these in parallel because they can be compared. They're all differentiating out against the rest of society. They're all co-evolving with each other. They all have problems of demarcation, of separating themselves out and maintaining a boundary condition and weeding out what's inside and outside. So this comparison continues now. I'm saying these other function systems has lead distinctions. This is just to show you, make plausible that category and that it is something larger than something which is only in architecture, which in a sense gives plausibility to my architectural theory because it, it fits into an overall comparative matrix of other function system and fits well within the theory of overall society. So for instance, you could say another big function system is the system of the sciences. So the autobus or discourse of the communication system of the sciences is fundamentally structured by this, by its lead distinction. So I'm just basically copy over that same slide and put in theory versus evidence. So what is an architecture form versus functions and the science of the theory versus evidence, it's the re-entry of the system environment distinction into the system because theory is the internal reference. That's what is creatively construed and constructed. It's actually theory which is an or in bracket explanation. That's the self-reference of science and evidence. Evidence is the external reference, the world reference, that which, that which has to be addressed <clears throat> through the explanatory theories. And then you can also formulate the whole task of all sciences is giving theory or explanation to evidence, all right? You can also reverse it and then, you know, which in the other coin of this is giving evidence to theory. But ultimately, so, so you can see how how neatly this idea works of lead distinctions uh, and the way these lead, and you know that theory and evidence is the key categories of science. And uh, the task formula makes sense and the, that this is a representation of uh, this, the system environment distinction within the system becomes also clear. I give you another version and there are a few more, but I only give you and have more in the table. So if you talk about the, uh, for instance, uh, sorry, I, I didn't write this correctly here, the legal system. This is about the legal system, not the sciences. It's norm versus fact or act in action and the norm or laws. Uh, that's what we're discussing. And the re it's a re-entry of the system and bind distinction again, because norm is the internal reference, the law which, 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 which the legal system kind of 
uh, is in charge of and deals with, and the facts or acts, actions, these are the external reference, the world reference, which they're addressing. And the task formula is somehow imposing norms on acts or imposing norms on facts, basically. I mean, the facts would be certain human action, which is categorized either as legal or illegal, and then uh, treated accordingly, for instance, with sanctioning uh, uh, those uh, illegal acts and trying to maintain a normative order, et cetera. So that works quite well here, right? So and we, there, there are more of those and I can show you more. For instance, here, I haven't written them out all. I said the next one is the lead. So we have all the lead distinctions here. And here you have, uh, you see which system. So for instance, in the political system, basically we have the lead distinction of position versus issue. And the task formula of the, the political party and the, uh, the, the politics is, is its task is to formulate and develop and propose and maybe implement certain positions of collective action um, uh, with respect to certain issues which become political issues. Um, another one is, for instance, in the economy, the lead distinction is price versus value. The task formula giving prices to values. And it's also the, of course, you can guess that the internal reference is price and prices which emerge in the economy. And the values is the underlying utility, which is basically in the environment of the economy, which is our private lives, our physiology, what we what we need to, to nourish ourselves and value. So, so this, um, concept of lead distinction as the representation or re-entry of the system environment distinction within the system works very well. It is, that's Luhmann's theory. I've had to clean it up a little bit to make it more neat and clear, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, so that works very well. Okay, going back to, um, and you see what this, uh, how satisfying it is when, <laughs> when let's say, I can theorize architecture along a kind of schema of questions and categories and you bringing in all the categories we're very familiar with within our discipline and locating them. And then we can also say somehow that debate about form and function and these reference, these categories will never disappear because they are at the heart <laughs> of the differentiation and self-constitution of the discipline relative to a task. That task of giving form to function, meaning that spatial framing in my, in my more abstract theoretical formulation uh, of what, why we have to, diff why, what's the raison d'etre of the whole differentiation of the design disciplines in the first place. Okay. Now, the next step in this is the autobuses of architecture is self relatively closed via the double code of utility and beauty. So what is a code? The code is, the code translates the lead distinction into the evaluative terms that guide the design decision process. So a positive evaluation of a design step means continue. A negative evaluation of a design step means try again. And uh, basically we're talking about the code is, uh, you know, form versus function is just the base categories. The code is then putting, bin uh, we're talking about binary codes and you see it in a minute, is really the um, operationalization of a decision process. It could also apply to the whole, to the whole design where you kind of reject uh, the whole design or you, you, you you, you appreciate and pick out the winner in the whole design. So, but before I go there with respect to the binary codes of architecture, let's remind ourselves, you know, very, very deeply in the history of architecture. I mean, I said architecture started in the Renaissance, that's correct, in more, uh, but there is premonitions. I mean, ancient Greece had something like architecture because they had architectural theory and they had named architects. We had, you know, the great Phidias, the designer of the Acropolis and you have Vitruvius. I mean, the Roman, he's kind of an echo of Greek um, treatises on art, theoretical treatises on architecture, which must have existed, although they haven't survived. What we have is Vitruvius, the Roman author, basically, but his whole theory of architecture has nothing to do with Roman architecture, which he is basically ignoring the advances and innovations 
of Roman architecture are not in the theory of architecture. So the, re the, the his theory is basically retrospective. It's probably a copy of a Greek treatise. But basically, in the truth, we have that Vitruvian triad of the qualities defining a good architecture. He has firmitas, firmness, utilitas, utility, and venustas, beauty. And um, basically, I was talking yesterday that, that firmitas means engineering, structural engineering, the stability is um, kicked out and it's now a separate discipline. So the differentiation moves forward. By the way, what's also important is that obviously we have these positive terms and always implied as a negative term. So firmness or infirmness, the instability, utility, the use, the useful versus the useless or the dysfunctional, beauty versus ugly, we'll come to that. I mean, so that would be the bind when we make a concept explicit, we realize that's also something Luhmann always emphasis, all concepts and in fact distinctions, right? Differences that make a difference. It's about difference, establishing differences. So basically all terms are always coming as binaries uh, with, with the negative, not, not, not always being implicit, not necessarily always being implied. I don't have to tell you you're beautiful and not ugly or you're ugly, <laughs> you know, it's implicit. Anyway, um, so this is the um, utility and beauty. It's very, very old categories. And we, it's interesting that we, we, that's the mystery part, which has often been contested. What is this role? And I, you know, I, will, I will lift the veil of mystery on that one and rationalize the concept of beauty for us here. But so what I've done is, so we have, um, two binary codes actually. And this is very important that I said earlier, if you don't work, talk about form and versus function, you're not in architecture. Here's even more, even more strictly, if you don't um, qualify your work with respect to the category or code of utility, you're not in architecture. Uh, so either useful or useless, uh, functioning, or, uh, dis functioning or dysfunctional, uh, so we, we come with this double with the binary code and we bring, that's always, always hovering there. Whenever you do, you, you, you're checking functional or dysfunctional, you know? And the thing is, it's important because if you don't do that, you're not belonging into architecture because for instance, the art, art, art was refusing that. You never ask the artwork whether it's functioning. Uh, it has no program for functioning and it, it, it doesn't want to be useful. Uh, you know, it's, it's meant to be outside of that. I mean, that's become part of the definition of contemporary art, not the previous. When architecture used to be part of the arts, and we're talking painting, sculpture, um, and also the arts and crafts, the code of utility did apply. I mean, these paintings all had a use case and they could be queried with respect to how well they perform with their explicit, deliberate use case. So, so I'm talking contemporary artists outside of that. Anyway, the second code, which is interesting, is the code of beauty, formally resolved or beautiful or formally unresolved, ugly. We, you know, beautiful and ugly, we, we obviously use it informally. Unless you want to be more refined in your language, you saw it formally resolved formally unresolved means you can do more work and there's something going on here. So that's always implied. And if it doesn't imply, if you reject that, I don't think you're in architecture. Maybe you're an engineer and the engineers don't recognize it. So these codes help to demarcate the discipline because only those who subscribe to the code, and this is literally every utterance, everything you point at, it's, these are always the lingering questions, always the relevance criteria. The code is always hovering there and always wants to be, you know, needs to be applied. Otherwise you're not progressing. You need to decide at every design step, whether this new addition, new shift, new variation increases functionality, but or decreases, increases beauty or decreases beauty. So that's part of the definition of our field. And you can see here, 
but the interesting thing here is this is highly abstract and historically contingent. And if you're particularly clear in the code of beauty, what are the ideals of beauty? They might be shifting. So what we found beautiful a hundred years ago, we don't find beautiful anymore. And uh, these have new ideas of beauty and what, I mean, in, in inverse and reverses. <clears throat> so, so that's an interesting one. So they're very abstract, generical, generic categories. They're universal and persistent. Why? Because they're very abstract. So we've been talking about this 500 years ago in architecture, and we still talk about this in architecture. And I think as uh, who is who is refusing to talk about it is refusing the field and discipline of architecture. That's my case. Now, what is interesting about there's another set of categories in 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 architectural theory with the long pedigree. So first of all, we have this here, utilitas, venustas, I, I kicked out firmitas, although that was in every treatise of architecture all the way into the um, middle of the 19th century, there was always a chapter on construction, on structure, construction, etc. It wasn't separate, um, but it is now fully separate. So what we have here is, utility and beauty, but we also have these categories, which I took. I mean, my key categories, if you look at volume two, which defines the task of architecture is organization and articulation. Organization is what we work in plan view and the layout. Adjacent sees what's you know, connecting and disconnecting, networking and so on and so forth in, in plan layout. And articulation is, you're raising that to a phenomenal three-dimensional condition. So you could say that's the perspective view, the, 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 the three dimensions, and, and also giving detailed texture ornament to some extent, clearly. That's a, what I call articulation. And that separates out into two agendas, what we're pursuing with articulation. One I call phenomenological articulation, which is trying to maintain perceptual tractability, and then semiological articulation, which is about uh, having referential semantic encodings in the in the morphologies. Anyway, and and these are have a very long pedigree, so basically very very deep history. So it, even in Vitruvius, you have organization is there that, that's a dispositio or distributio in the in the English treatises, uh, architectural uh, let's say uh, uh, treatises of the 19th century. They call, talk about distribution. And the other big category is, let's say, decus, decorare, decor, decoration. Um, and again, they have the third, I mean, these are the three, the books, you know, you, you're learning, these are the values, and these are the chapters of the book. Dispositio or distribution, and then you have ornament and decoration, and then you have construction. That third chapter has been kind of, has separated out, has differentiated into a new discipline, engineering, and become infinitely more complex, of course, because we didn't have proper engineering calculations. We just had the concern with construction, with craft-like. So what is interesting here is, so these persist, but what I'm saying here is that you might have thought that there's a strong alignment that utility is something which through which we criticize organization or the value of utility only applies to organization and the value of beauty only applies to articulation. This sometimes it seems like that, you know, that the, the element of beauty comes through in the ornament, but no, sorry. <laughs> in my theory of architecture, and I think you think it deeper, no, we actually have these categories are not aligned, they're orthogonal to each other, meaning you have a free combination so you can actually have a useful or useless organization. I mean, that's normal. We, that's you would have expected. But you also can have, and that's very important, a useful or useless articulation. So decoration is not only being judged, in my theory of architecture, by um, beauty here, which is what we expect, beautiful articulation, ugly articulation, but it is also part of the social functionality. It needs to be functionally critiqued because it is a semiological system which needs to function well, needs to be systematically built and systematically characterized 
And there is, in fact, in the theory of architecture, let's say, particularly in the 17, 18th century French theory of architecture, Blondel, you find, um, or late 17th, early 18th century, you find the, you know, the integration of this idea of expression and character, basically borrowing from the theater. I mean, look, even, even throughout its history, architecture was borrowing categories from related fields. The whole concept of a style comes out of writing style, stylus, and obviously made, it was, was very easily absorbed with you know, sketching style and drawing style and architectural style, but the idea of expression and character, um, basically the distinction of atmospheres, enters architectural theory through uh, the theater and you have different scenes and moods and modes. And then they're saying, so the, the decoration of a space, you could have something somber and austere, maybe like um, a, a uh, vault of ancestors, etc. Or you have something where you, where you have a gay, a gay kind of festival, a, a, a a delightful dance, and there you have a delightful and gay atmosphere, etc. So these are ideas of atmosphere and expression. That's precisely then uh, also expressed with uh, decoration, and means the decoration is the system of signification. It's basically a semiotic code which characterizes the social situations which you should expect and brings people up to the mood and mode and brings them into the prime the, the priming effect of this. this is a social ordering effect so it's a functional functioning and then we also obviously we, we can in, in the inverse so so let's put it this way these two these two are the things we would have expected and these two that we actually can critique decoration functionally is something which i'm emphasizing and it's not usually uh, presumed. And here we are also critiquing the organization, plain layout with respect to aesthetic values, mainly beautiful or ugly or formally resolved, formally unresolved. And we come to that, what does that mean? Why is that even legitimate? So a lot of people were trying to skip that and chuck this up altogether. But, and I will come to explain to that. I mean, there was meant to be another lecture on this, but let's see um, that why I'm defending that. And I will come to that. So anyway, the observance of the code demarcates, meaning if you buy into the code, if you're working with the code, that demarcates the system and makes it unmistakably identify, identifiable to itself. So who is part of architecture? All those who are working with the code, who will continuously have their code sen antennas sensitized. Um, the particular code, you know, the, 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 the code of utility and beauty. And only com communications that submit to the code are accepted as architectural communications. So if you have, you know, that's why I think a lot of things which, which are going on in the uh, schools of architecture now, they have escaped out of the realm of architecture. They would say, well, I don't want to talk about utility and beauty. I want to talk, you know, about political, about justice. And I want to talk about equity and, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and I have nothing to do with utility. I mean, this is kind of, this is kind of a bad, it is boring pragmatism or beauty is frivolous, et cetera, et cetera. So here you can see that if you apply <laughs> the double code of utility and beauty as a criterion of uh, system uh, boundary, a lot what's going on in architecture, inverted commas, uh, in schools of architecture and exhibitions and biennales is uh, no longer, has is, is escaped the boundary and is outside of architecture. I mean, this, I didn't need that theory, it's just the theory confirms what we, what we discussed yesterday anyway, without referring to that particular, let's say, mechanism of boundary maintenance. It's a demarcation, um, uh, it has its own function, of course, within, because that's the way you drive the, the task formula in the end. And that's why you work towards giving form and function. Uh, but it's also a boundary 
identifier. Okay, so now we're coming from the codes to the programs. Codes need to be programmed or conditioned, made concrete, because the code is super abstract. Because uh, although you know you should always look out for uh, the useful and the and the beautiful, you what does the co concrete criteria? How do you recognize that? You need to, uh, in particular as this shifts and changes, what's you know what uh, what was a functioning social functionality layout in you know in nineteen hundred is no longer uh, so in the in tw in in, in twenty one hundred. And similarly, with respect to what we recognize as as formally resolved or beautiful, has has shifted. So, 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 which is the strength of the code? That degree of abstraction imposes that binary structure and double binary on all architectural uh, communications. But it it needs to be fleshed out and concretized in each, let's say historical era so i just read that quickly so the um the code versus program that's a piece of um theorizing coming out of lumen as well and basically i could do what i've started with the lead distinction and can do the same with the other function system so if you have the uh, you know we have beautiful ugly or uh, functional dysfunctionally in the in architecture the design disciplines we actually have legal illegal in the in the um uh, uh, legal system we have truth and false or probable improbable in the sciences. Now these kind of simple binaries, which you're always, you know, will always relevant. Uh, in the political system, it's maybe left, right, or progressive, conservative, or in fact, um, um, gov you know, um, affirmative respect to government versus oppositional. So there's these bi binaries. And uh, sometimes there's one primary and sometimes there's more than one. Anyway, so so the binary value of codes, a historically invariant communication structure of the function systems. And that's general now. They ensure the historical continuity of the unity and demarcation of the respective function systems. Together, they allow the differentiation of society into these mutually exclusive and unique function systems to persist as ultra stable. I mean, these are very, very long, la long lasting, persistent, Function systems, in the political system, economic system, legal system, they have been separated for hundreds of years. Doesn't mean that there could be further differentiation. Like I said, the engineering disciplines differentiating out in um, the 19th century. And by the way, I just want to go up here. This demarcation, organization articulation, although I'm not advocating it, it could become a further differentiation where this becomes a specialization versus this, and you see hints of that. For instance, you have corporate space planning firms who are not necessarily the interior design fleshing out the design. Inside offices, in terms of our insolid architects and in the project teams, we often have those who are doing this and those who do, let's say the 2D plan diagrams and program layouts and connections and, if, if, and, and then the 3D. I think they need to be closely <laughs> connected and iterating back between and forth so but if they should be that further split off then this would be and you have companies like span syntax which are only doing this they don't even doing they're kind of specialists consultants in organization um then i would then the question was okay if this splits up which one picks up the mantle and prestige label of architecture i mean you can have a guess I'm saying this part will pick up the mantle of architecture and this becomes another subsidiary. Anyway, it's because this is more science related and it could, could be more treated like an engineering discipline, although I'm not advocating this, by the way. So I'm just saying, I'm just speculating within the category system of category, would I, if, could I predict something? If there's a lot of pressure of further specialization, that's gonna be the dividing line right here. Okay, so, I was saying abstractness of the code values that makes them these codes can persist unaltered due to the abstractness. By themselves, they only mark what belongs or does not belong to the respective system of communications. The application of the code values to particular concrete designs or design decisions requires historically variable programs, meaning a set of criteria which are now defining the beautiful, set of criteria which are now defining the functional. You can 
maybe guess where this is going. The codes need to be reprogrammed in each historical epoch so that the particular morphologies that are viable under the socioeconomic conditions of this epoch can be valued positively, identified as, for instance, as beautiful as functional. These programs specify at any time the operational criteria by which the positive and negative values can be applied to given or proposed instances of urban or architectural form or any other design form, including fashion, <clears throat> you know, including web design, metaverse design, etc. So in case, in the case of architecture, these historically variable adaptive programs are known as styles. So that's where styles come in. And you can see already that they're an absolute necessity within the system of architecture because you need to formulate these programs. Now, and that's where also the parallel comes in with the concept of paradigm within the sciences. Paradigm, the sciences, the code is truth versus false or probable, I mean, credible versus improbable, implausible as an explanation. So these are super abstract. And there needs to be sets of criteria of let's say scientific rigor of how to set up you know, methodologies of empirical, uh, you know, setting up experiments with control groups and randomized trials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These would be paradigm shifts as we move from style to style and redefine the conditions concretely within an era by which we identify um, the beautiful, the functional in the sciences. These are paradigms in each science through which we now, you know, uh, have, a to have a different conception of what we recognize as a well corroborated true or probable theory is in the 21st century quite different from the um, 19th century, for instance. So that's another very strong parallel. And for instance, the political systems, when you do talk about progressive, regressive, or um, 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 you would have concretely defining that through political manifestos, for instance, or the ideology. So that those would be the programs of the political system. So this category of the program versus code is again a, something which appears in every function system. And I would say it is clear that this role has been played by the styles. It's clear that it's a necessity. And so that may, I think that gives a lot of weight and plausibility to the necessity of styles. So the meaning, if you want to chuck out the category, basically you're rudderless. You know, they have no sets of criteria validated historically through discourse, of course, through which you can, uh, you know, navigate the continuously nagging question, are you making progress or regress on in, in, your, in your design with the, with the next proposal or variation or so on and so forth. You basically, uh, uh, you, you, you kill off your, <laughs> your whole tool of rationality. So here we go. I just mark that out. We have styles, we have research programs or paradigms. There's different phrases, but it's interesting. I'm looking at, uh, so the, the concept of paradigm was explicitly introduced into the philosophy of science by Thomas Kuhn in the 19, early 60s, or the late 19s, late 50s. I forgot when, when the uh, book on scientific evolution was published and become a and, and it's never, never gone away as a key category. So they're relatively late with bringing that in compared to you know, the, where the concept of style was explicit in architecture in the 19th century. Uh, the scientists discovered the concept of paradigm and paradigm shift in the 20th century. And the, con and the word which Lakatos, Omri Lakatos is one of the great philosophy, the philosophers of science building on Popper and Kuhn and I'm very much related, in, I'm absorbing a lot of his work on what he calls research programs. And I'm basically learning, making a lot of the comparison between the concept of style and Lakatos concept of paradigm slash research programs. That's what I'm also saying. Styles are design programs, styles are design research programs. But here you can see as well in the, for instance, the education, uh, the, the programs are the curricula, which keeps shifting historically. 
the ideologies or party programs or manifestos in the political system, in the legal system, it's you know things like the constitution and the kind of system of statutes, etc. Okay, um, there can be no rational process without an underlying explicit or implicit style. So you can you fuse to say you can say I have no style, which means only you don't know what you you don't self reflect deeply enough. And of course, there is these epochal styles, the styles of movement, which are discursively defended. That's the styles we should focus on. And of course, you could also say that each office has its own kind of in-house style. Each individual has a certain style. And I accept that, but usually these are not rationalized styles. Usually they have not been argued for, they can't be argued for, you don't, you would be have to, you know, no, no architect and firm has the resources to develop it, to defend and formalize its own personal in-house style. And I've not done that. I've concepted my efforts to formalize, rationalize, defend the style of parametricism. And therefore, when I am always proud to say and happy if people recognize our work as a work of parametricism, I'm not so happy and proud if they recognize the work of Zadid architects because that's something more specific and particular which I cannot defend, which if, if it indicates anything, it indicates a limitation that we within Zadid architects don't have the full versatility of the whole movement of parametricism at our fingertips because we're limited. We have, you know, we have certain characters and teams and, and, and internal references which are narrower than parametricism and that moving, uh, basically narrowing down to the in-house Zaha Hadid style is something which we should overcome. And Zaha had always that spirit. She, she <laughs> didn't want to be recognized. As, the clients who want Zaha style, they're actually limiting us in ways we don't want to be limited. It's not that we actually can get out of our skin always. People can still spot it. I mean, it's it's relatively easy to spot if there's not many other parametricists around. Then you could say, well, okay, that's a passport total. Okay, they recognize Zaha Did. Actually, what you know, I mean, it, what it really is actually a version of parametricism which has overcome the in-house limitations. Anyway. But there is, of course, personal individuals. So every every designer has, to some extent, a personal style. But it's not something we should be proud of, I suspect, because it means if we if we keep repeating ourselves to a certain extent. Uh, um, although I fully say within parametricism, actually going outside of this means only going backwards into retro styles. I don't think there's anything easily progressive. Or there's two chances. If you go outside the bounds of parametricism, by the way, which are huge. You're either going back to retrogression or you're going out into idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic nonsense. <laughs> okay. Likely, likelihood being. Anyway. Um, so I'm now saying this analogy styles as design research programs, meaning styles as paradigms. But I like the phrase design research programs because we also have the design research lab, the DRL, and we have, actually, I have, um, in the book itself, there's a, a, a much further detailing out of using the analogy with design research. For instance, there's a hard core and the soft periphery within, uh, you know, there are, but what, what, what comes out of this is the idea of heuristics, positive heuristics, negative heuristics, which I'm, so that comes from Lakatosh. So it's interesting, once you establish the analogy and realize that styles are doing something very, very similar to research programs or paradigms in the sciences, you can then draw and bring new interesting ways of talking about architecture out of that. You, you, you bring over the, the vocabulary and give it architectural meaning that work extremely well, I would argue. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in terms of the, the, the positive negative heuristics concept and uh, from Lakatosh, by the way, his, his, his main work is called um, something like the methodology of, of research programs. <clears throat> anyway, so innovation in architecture proceeds via the progression of styles. This implies the alternation between periods of cumulative advancements within a style let's say 1920 to 1960 or 70 or 1910 to 1970, 
and revolutionary periods of transition between styles. That's the transition from, you know, 19th century to 20th century. And again, the transition into, uh, let's say, parametricism. So styles represent cycles of innovation, gathering design research effort into a collective endeavor. Stable self-identity is here as much a necessary precondition of evolution as it is in the case of organic life. So basically, if you want to get somewhere with a new paradigm or style, you need a real, you need a bit of time. You need a few decades, <laughs> many years, and you need a lot of contributors. You need a cumulative development. And we had that in Paris. So it's wonderful how where we've reached and we wish we had more protagonists and we had, you know, we, 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 we need, we need further years, but we've reached very far already. Anyway, so stable self, and that means this idea, I mean, that was the illusion of the 1980s, which also also experienced that it seems every three years there's a new style every five years. You know, postmodernism, neoclassicism, minimalism came up and then deconstructism. I mean, it seems like, wow, we can invent new styles. Uh, no, sorry. And Mies got it right when he said, you can't invent a new style or principle of architecture, a new architecture every Monday morning. No, he, he, he realized and he was that he was steadfast in developing a paradigm and a particular subsidiary, you know, personal <laughs> version of modernism. Um, for many decades to perfection. Okay, and then he had a huge influence, of course. So, um, right, so, so it's, a, it's important to hold on to the new principles in the face of difficulties. That is crucial for the chance of eventual success. This is talking about when you're the beginning, let's say, we, when, we, when we started parametrism, of course, we were infantile and, you, you know, we couldn't win against the minimalist at that point. And we were battered and dismissed and laughed at, but then you have to, you know what you're doing. This, there needs to be this kind of holding on this head. That's the avant-garde phase. Avant-garde versus mainstream is another fundamental category of the design disciplines, which I am positive about. And we need the avant-garde to continuously accelerate innovation. But then we need to also move from avant-garde to mainstream. This tenacity, abundantly evident within contemporary avant-garde, might at times appear as dogmatic obstinacy. For instance, the obstinate system of solving everything with a folding single surface or now with a modulated component arrays. You can see that was written a few years ago. <laughs> project upon project, slowly wrenching the plausible from the implausible, might be compared to the Newtonian insistence to explain everything from planets to bullets to atoms in terms of the same principles. So I think that we said, okay, the principles of parametrism, they apply to everything. And we're doing parametric urbanism, we do parametric interior design and furniture and fashion and everything. And we're gonna be rigorous about it. We're not gonna fall back to easy solutions. And we're going to work with the, apply the two positive and negative heuristics all the way through never clinching or flinching away from for instance, falling, relapsing back to retro styles. I mean, the taboos, I call them, I was strong, I called the negative heuristics taboos. It was really taboo for that whole generation to ever draw up a box or a series of repetition endlessly or have, you know, a strong symmetry proportion in the system. So we know this, these were, these were signs of retrogression. Never have you ever seen a parameter, I mean, you know, using blobs and adaptive <laughs> metabols and instead of having circles and spheres, we don't just collage things, we're always transitioning. I mean, these, I mean, uh, uh, we don't just have, you know, unmediated juxtaposition. So these were absolute taboos. Nobody ever, you, you'd rather break your pen or, you know, or stop. You know, I mean, and you wouldn't be respected by your peers if you would do that. So, so that tenacity was is very important. Begin, anyway. So, so the, the, I'm, I'm anticipating this idea of positive and negative heuristics, which need to be becoming. I call them taboos and dogmas, and that was a provocative phrase, but it's very important for 
to have the consistent approach and show its potency and not lapsing back to quick solutions to win a competition to to make it to be easy on yourself anyway i think i'm i'm running out of time i will i will probably open the conversation now although I, there's a bit more which i think so i'm going to continue with that lecture on styles uh, tomorrow and um yeah let's let's start discuss Great. Um, thank you, Patrick, for the interesting. My pleasure. Let me stop <laughs> sharing as well. Okay. So pleasure, uh, Yan Chao here, and also we invite another prof uh, professor from University of Queensland, Luo Dan, who is used to be the student of uh, Xu Wei Guo and right now moving to Australia. I think uh, she. Oh, yeah. probably so Xiao, I mean, just to. Um, in the second half of this lecture, which I think I shouldn't go through because it would be another 45 minutes, I will bring up tectonism. So, okay. <laughs> so I have to, I've shifted that to tomorrow. Okay. I think uh, you, you mentioned the progression of the styles, which is like an um, evolution process for the avant garde. Yeah. Uh, to going even further uh, to the future, right? I think um, that's uh, very interesting. Uh, today's uh, lecture, you introduced the styles, um, which actually uh, play a very important role to integrate uh, not only uh, the the form but also the function, the functionality, which actually um, uh, 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 binary uh, influenced uh, the beauty and utility. Of yeah. architecture, I think uh, that's 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 fantastic um, uh, uh, point and very clear. So uh, my question goes to because uh, maybe I ask firstly because in your uh, nearly uh, article and also in your a uh, uh, lot of lectures recently, you mentioned the next what's next, which it may be from uh, the parametricism uh, which you you put forward like um, fifteen years ago. But right now you have a lot of talks on the. Uh, on the uh, metaverse, and uh, uh, from your point of a, a progression of the styles, I find you 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 you, you recently actually you, you have a very strong interest in the uh, the map metaverse. Could you uh, correspondingly uh, talking about this kind of um, the code of beauty and code of uh, utility? How would you like to address uh, your thinking about the, the the metaverse and the parametricism? Is there any yeah. Issue, um, uh, linkage, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, um, thanks for the question. So, first of all, I haven't, what is coming also in the second half and meaning tomorrow, uh, is mm -hmm. the un, you know, pulling the whale of mystery of the category of beauty. Basically, mm -hmm. I can anticipate this. So, it seems as we have two categories utility and beauty, and in the end, what I realized that beauty is underneath it is also, in fact, functionality utility. But it's an intuitive, immediate, intuitive, emotional recognition, conditioned mm -hmm. and tra recognition of, of the functional or dysfunctional in, in, in a direct intuitive class. Whereas they, when we're talking about utility, we need to have an analytical approach and the demonstration. And, but this is not always possible because we have too many aspects and we often have to move fast. And that's why we have, we have that supercomputer here neural where, where we where it's a black box and we know and that's you know let's say that implicit knowledge of somebody who's trained up in a complex topic he can he can make these distinctions he can say yes this and this not not knowing precisely why but if you stand back and analyze you can then critique and rationalize those those decisions and um, and find that there's an underlying rationality, which is basically you hitting the same utility and beauty converging on the same select point of selection of an option, for instance, and judgment. That is not absolutely the case, but and if there's a tension, we need to discuss further. Mm -hmm. uh, and anyway, I will discuss more of that. So, which which is which is interesting. So that we we can. We shouldn't harshly 
they're certainly not opposites. Um, that in fact, as if you pursue beauty that you kind of neglect or, or violate utility. And if you pursue the utility that you automatically violate beauty. Actually, the, and this is, there's a lot of history in the, the discourse of architecture about this, where for instance, in the radical functionalism discourse and around in the modernist, there's quite a few who said, you know, um, uh, you know, focus on function, beauty will take care of itself. Uh, because, the, you know, you, you find an organic nature, which is, of course, if you driven performance ways, and still we find that beauty, that order, that elegance. So, so there's some that I'm uh, aligning to this. And, and, and oftentimes, when, if you talk about symmetry and proportion in the Renaissance, if you have, for instance, basically these proportions, they're actually structural rules of thumb, which have evolved out of experience. For instance, certain proportions of opening and column, the thickness of the column to the height of the column, that you pull that on the window proportions, that you pull the, fire, the windows a bit away from the edge because you have, you have horizontal forces pushing, so you need more fleshed. Um, there's a lot of these, and, and in Palladios also, the height, the depth is lighting, natural lighting condition. So there's a lot of technical functionality issues and also of social functionality issues, which are condensing into, let's say, solutions, which we then internalize and get used to and are trained up to like and have good reasons to like. And you can disseminate, you can bring somebody up by not, and then you can leave out the analytics and you can then disseminate it to a lot of people who can design without, the analytics is very difficult. Not many people are sophisticated and bright enough. So you could actually, the advantage of working on principles of formally unresolved if beauty, and you can work quite intuitively and you will get it right. And, and you also don't have the time. And even when you work yourself, you, you know, so, so this is kind of the instant recognition element of the rational, which should be then validated analytically. Now, oftentimes when you have outmoded sensibilities, when you like yesteryear's performance morphologies, then you obviously, you have to relearn new ideals of beauty. You have to retrain your taste, you train your sensibilities. Otherwise you're dysfunctional. Your sensibilities become dysfunctional. You continuously choose basically no longer functional solutions, which might also the way you navigate moral sensibility. Similarly, you, you have a very conservative, old fashioned, intuitive reaction to certain behaviors and codes. It's very similar, it's very parallel. This is an intuitive element. You're not only you continuously, you know, choose the wrong buildings, the wrong spaces, which are really function for you. You choose, I mean, aesthetically also, you, 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 you're mixing with people, you know, who are not good for you, 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 you have moral sensibilities, which are, so anyway, so that's the way we're talking about beauty and, and utility. They're actually homing in on the same thing, but that means they need to be historically updated as well. That's we need aesthetic revolutions as well as revolutions in the discourse and stylistic revolutions, right? So, so, and that's the progress on the large scale. Now, the metaverse question is very interesting. Um, and by the way, the avant-garde mainstream thing, is also helping in this in this sense um, that that at the beginning you need to have this. It's experimental. You you, you know you, you you maybe the thing isn't fully developed, but you need to commit to it. Uh, without you're not you're not winning yet. I mean you have you know it's like the uh, <laughs> the the early adopters they're trying out things. It's still way too expensive. It's still not managing to include, for instance, constructability issues and so on and so forth. So that's what you need avant-garde for and special institutions like using educations, using grants, using research, using museums, using the art system as a way of resourcing that to bring the incubate that avant-garde, but the push into the mainstream should also be wanted. We should be, we should not say, no, no, I don't want to have anything to do with the mainstream. I want to be, I'm, I'm, I'm a lifelong avant-garde I don't think that's, you know what I mean? Okay, you, 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 you want to self-marginalize eventually. No, no, no. Anyway, so metaverse, I come to this point now. As far as I can see for now, the, and that's because of the strengths of the analogy of the metaverse 
with physical interior spaces, physical buildings, physical cities, the strengths of this analogy and the reliance on um, using our familiarity and the navigability possibility and with, 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 let's say, architectural and urban design, et cetera, as well as the similarity and nearly identity of the social processes which are now moving from the physical environments into the virtual environments means, as far as I can see, that the style of parametricism continues to be relevant within the metaverse. And actually it can also absorb some of the new challenges which come to a designers in the metaverse. For instance, that they need, you need you, maybe there becomes a demand of real-time adaptation, which a amoeba form parametrism project can do better than a crystalline neo-baroque or, uh, you know, how do, should that adapt with maintaining its identity? So there are advantages which come out, which are already there. How do you, you know, how do you adapt a, a, in a, in a formalist insistence on a, the formalist insistence on, let's say, a neoclassical layout and symmetry proportionate design is, is anyway a massive violation of functional contingencies which you need to accommodate already in the real world. And if it comes, if you, if you then have to be malleable, you realize that this, that this neoclassical malleability can only scale up and down in all parts simultaneously. And that has always been the case in, in classicism. You can just, you know, the, 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 the system of classical columnal orders and ornament were all proportional. Everything scales up, <laughs> but that's very constraining. And if you want to do other adaptations, then you generate monsters. So for, as far as I can see, parametrism is, is going to be, um, is the style. I don't have to, it doesn't, there's no new style on the horizon just because, and whatever it develops now, particular features, we will see. Um, you know, this becomes more fluid, this becomes more free floating. The challenge is more to the style of tectonism, right? That latest, because, because that was strongly built on te technical constraints, engineering constraints, and the engineering has left the scene. What is interesting for me, when you go from, uh, let's say, physical design into metaverse design, what we're doing as designers is one-to-one -one transfers over. You know, the, the, the idea of organizing, the idea of articulating phenomenology criteria, semiology criteria, um, intervisibility, interawareness, complexity, dynamism, adaptive, responsive, et cetera, et cetera. All, of the, all the themes are there, even more distilled. And we, our teams are just seamlessly going in. But all the engineering is left behind and a whole new engineering stack comes in, polygon counts, refresh rates, et cetera. Um, um, and how many how many things can come into view simultaneously before you know and how many people can be hosted by a server and how do you break it up into groups of hundreds of so new constraints let's say coming in but now this is wow and what has happening to, to tectonism now the interesting thing is for me when i was arguing for tectonism it's a two prone set of arguments one of course it's directly engineering rationality and architecture has to work with these constraints, all the better. And we, 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 you know, we, we can, we can, we will be light-footed. We will be efficient. We're wasting less space on Porsche and huge ducts. And, and and like in our early work, we we have these surfaces, and in between there's cubic meter of strange structure filling voids. And now we have you know thin shells. But so that part obviously we don't need the rationality of engineering. But what my main argument, what, why I love tectonism so much, and we are pursuing it in the firm, is not only the pragmatic issues, which I, are important, but the, verse, the richness of articulatory medium. So before we only had maybe, you know, subdiv or nerve surfaces, a certain type of geometry, and then we had flat, and maybe we had a tessellation on it based on acid palms or something. Now we have all these much more richer repertoire of characters. We have, you know, we have the compression 
shells, we have the tensile anticlastic structures, we have inflatables, we have a ruled surface, we have curved folding, which is all developable. And this is interesting about you can each of them can be very versatile and 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 and, and pick up every plan. And that, but it's much more differentiated, much more types of characters, different materials. You, I love the tool path of the milling, of the 3D printing. All of this is ornament, semiology, morphology. So, so there's an enormous enrichment of the semiological project and feminine project because light and shadow playing on the surface. So, so with respect to this part, these aspects of tectonomism are, can first of all be imported into the metaverse with good effect. Because what I realized, for instance, if you do a larger project, like for instance, if you do, we did Google Campus at the GSD a few years ago. And then we had already, you, you, you were trying different systems, different tectonic systems. You know, um, you know the Fry Otto uh, wool thread shells, and then kind of soft grid shells and tensor and all of that. And catenaries, each of, each of these were projects. And of course, there's a lot of internal differentiation. But when you look at each of them, the whole campus made of catenaries, even though they have different proportions, so it becomes homogenous and illegible. And I said, wow, we need to, all of these different systems in the campus to differentiate and make in between. Otherwise, it becomes more not in these. So basically, I was saying parametric, normal pre tectonism parametrism is basically. It's a hard word, bankrupt when it comes to these large, intricate, complex projects like a Google campus. We only tectonism can solve that purely on a legibility, orientation, recognition, navigation, variation, versatility, unity across difference. We need more qualitative difference. I mean, that's something like if you hear Ali Rahim talk, qualitative difference, he wants difference, difference, difference. Now he has to invent that out of, isn't like an artistic project. And that's hard and difficult. And we said, no, we don't, we have it. Nature, I mean, tech, the, all these new engineers, they, we get it for free and we have the finished. So we get it for free and we can bring it in, but we can also now, so this will mix up. We also said free, we can do the Ali Rahim thing where we are just inventing further differentiation and characterfulness. So tectonism is in, but it will get, let's say, it, it can't remain pure because we don't have the engineering constraints. Although still, I think in the metaverse, you want implied artificial gravity as an orienting. You want to still know there's a ground, there's some, there's a vertical orienting. You don't want to be flying, people flying in space and in and, and the chaos of geometry. In how can you orient and then you also you can't use anything from from the real world. So I think there is, and we have been debating a lot, you, you still have columns in the metaverse. And then you will realize what the column still does, even in the metaverse, two things. First of all, you can have columns, colonnades and so on, which imply differentiations you see through. It's a threshold, a demarcation. But also if you have everything floating and you don't tie it back to the ground, you don't know where they are in space. You don't know how high or deep the building is. So pinning it down all to plotting it all with structural positioning points onto a surface, which you can see positions things much better in space. So it is interesting <clears throat> that, yeah, let's say the phenology semiological project brings part, brings parametrism full on, brings part of tectonism into play, but also we'll have, let's say, I call it now the Ali Rahim version of qualitative differentiation has now also it's, and will mix up and pollute. So tectonism cannot become, remain pure. Uh, I have to say so, but I have to be honest with myself. I love tectonism, but I have to say that in the metaverse, it has a role, but that role will, be, will not remain so pure, although the rigor of having these systems um, uh, is very important, but you can now go and invent new systems that are not necessarily based on engineering logics. They're purely um, pure semiological system designs, which can come in uh, as well now. But I don't see a new style. <laughs>
Maybe. Anyway, it will always happen 10 years later before you really see it. Yeah. You can't, like you can't plan. I cannot say, I'm going to generate a new style. <laughs> Wait, let me do it. I've never, yeah. I don't think I've, anybody have ever succeeded with that. Yeah. Rodan, would you like to uh, put forward yes. your question? Hi. Um, good morning or evening, Patrick. So I just want to follow up with a question because uh, like um, um, I have been attended your workshop and uh, courses a few years ago in the Chinese Academy of Arts as well. So and uh, followed by this session. So I'm uh, I noticed that in your series, you have been placed a big emphasis on um, network structures, uh, organizational structures, and how their um, the influence and social structures and how they're influencing the development of style, the the structure of the ways of our work, as well as the um, like development of uh, architecture and style. So um, and they like for your like this year you have been mentioning about metaverse and the significance of architecture in the metaverse and etc. So because lately I have been working with quite some companies um, um, like social networks and the one thing I have noticed is that the one significant um, feature of those social networks is that they're actually experiencing with different social structures and networks. For example, if you look from YouTube to TikTok to Instagram, and if we put the social structures into a network, they have a distinct like master slave follow, uh, opinion leader follower paradigm between different social um, social networks. And uh, as a result, each social network generates contents that are unique to itself. So I think like maybe for architecture in metaverse, instead of the personal opinions, um, but is it possible that there is a possibility where like the restructure of the social structure can actually impacting the generated contents of design instead of let's say subconscious uh, like conscious decision of the designer. For example, like TikTok generates unique contents because it gives the liberty of easily borrowing from other creators' contents and add it into yours. So at the end of the day, the best influencer is actually creates contents that are easily to be duplicated and creates this kind of network of influence by having this kind of virtual communication with, let's say, other opinion leaders and etc. And at the end of the day, this all together Together forms this kind of like a cluster of similar style of contents. So like um, hypothetically, maybe at future metaverse, some of the most influencer styles will be of course echoes with the code of utilities aesthetic, but may also be related to how easily they can be duplicated and maneuvered by other people or et cetera. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, um, I, I, I mean, you're obviously working on something very interesting, which is network structures in social media networks, influencers, and this kind of interesting what you're talking about, the, the leader follower. You have a lot of concentration of these kind of hubs and points of influence where you have a lot of accumulation. So the distribution um, in terms of, let's say, uh, followers is, 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 there's huge differentiations, which is interesting. And I don't, I mean, it's, it, it makes me think I haven't thought about it too much in terms of what we, we think in terms of metaverse is not so much individual influencers, how they would position themselves, how they transfer the Instagram uh, site or the, their Facebook pages into, into a, a, a metaverse. It's a very interesting question. This aspect of social communication, which is more freewheeling and, and, and not related directly to, let's say, work, research, conferencing, and so on, which is my domain. But even in the, in the world of, um, let's say, startup companies, which I'm interested in, for instance, Liberland Metaverse is about the, the, the crypto ecosystem where you have, uh, you know, clusters of various projects. You have a lot of, a, a huge network of collaboration, but also of uh, utilizing, I mean, it's this kind of Lego, <clears throat> modular system where, we, where you have money Legos, where, 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 where a lot of new DeFi projects depend on taking other uh, components, stack them up and create new projects. It's a highly 
interwoven thing. And there you also obviously have a kind of distribution of very strong nodes, very strong anchor projects. So it's these kind of hierarchical, multi polycentric uh, systems. And it's interesting to try to represent that and try to find the spatialization which makes sense. Um, and, um, and so, so I'm, I'm glad you talk of bringing something new to light, which is more the, the world of influences and and uh, more freewheeling communication, maybe infotainment, uh, more through kind of for private pleasure and, and, and stimulation, etc. So it is an interesting one. But I suspect the network logics. Yeah, I'm very much very interested in in all of that and. Uh, social network analysis has been a fascination of mine for many years, and there's a lot of interesting categories and measures. And um, yeah, there's this kind of fantastic also network effect things where things kind of accumulate and and uh, and and not there's not an even distribution. But there's anyway. So I'm I'm fascinated by this as a challenge. So so to to um, to use let's say social network analysis. Of the various program components as an underlying di diagrammatic technique and methodology, um, as which which we, which one could could develop to look and look at and see how that would spatialize, um, because these these abstract graphs they're not necessarily easily spatializable, and there are many different ways in which they can spatialize. So there's an interesting um, uh, one way mapping from um, you have a spatial network, of course, yes has you spatialize the network that has a, a one, it has one underlying, uh, uh, let's say, mathematical network. But if you have a mathematical network, there are, there are kind of many, many different ways of spatializing this. So I, I'm, I'm very fascinated by this. In particular, exploiting the 3D more fully uh, is going to be, it's already, we're trying that, of course, in the real world by opening the section, having atrium where you, where you look across and see 20, what happens on 10 three different floors. You need a lot of porosity. So the, the more the metaverse allowing for more three-dimensionalization, that will push in and it will start to challenge what I said earlier, that you need kind of the ordering principle of gravity and you know privileging of a ground surface. I am, yeah, thanks a lot. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I'm fascinated and stimulated by a, by a question. It's definitely an area of research and it's fascinating. Things like scale-free networks, small world networks, um, which, which we need to understand. And, if, and, and it is true that the challenge is, you know, we, we, we have the analogy with the city, but we also need to zoom out more and come in more. Uh, I mean, potentially, these networks are larger than any city. And also, I mean, of course, there are always pockets. I mean, let's say if you have a huge community in Facebook, but for each individual, it's not, not all of the others are relevant. So there are also pockets of cliques and subsidiary networks, you need to isolate these clusters and between clusters, maybe less traffic and so on. Fascinating, fascinating uh, condition. And anyway, I do, I do feel that that um, th this, this phenomenon is very pertinent in something like the crypto ecosystem or in these in creative industry hubs, knowledge economy hubs, um, and where you, where, 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 where it's really um, better inverted commas, not to be inclusive, not to say, well, everybody should be, you know, <laughs> if everybody is here, then these irrelevant participants fill up and block the connections between the relevant participants. So it's really selective. This, the, the, this kind of selectiveness of clustering and how one allows for this and how is the system flexible to this? That's for me a fascinating challenge in the metaverse. It's also in a city, and unfortunately, in the city, there's so much, let's say, noise in the system, so much fixity and ide false ideology and lack of degrees of freedom that these synergy clusters don't don't come together. They only come together in individual projects, uh, you know. And that has to be quite exclusive. Inclusive, let's say, if, and if you have an attractive if, if you if you bring in key contractive key tenants into your project, wow, then there's a search. If you get Google campus into your building in London, <laughs> then you have thousand up, you know, thousand tech companies applying to, to join in. I mean, there's this fantastic nice example here of second home in London, which is a super in exclusive <laughs> a cluster. And basically the way it works in, in the metaverse and it sometimes works in the city 
And that's when it's the city of London, which is a fantastically dense cluster. Basically, if there's not, if there's scarcity of space and there's scarcity of connection space, because there's too many, it doesn't work. It is ultimately it's 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 price. You know, there will be the price mechanism will will bring in the most urgent, the most valuable, the most productive come together and squeeze out all those who can pay the price because they basically they're not as importantly and productively required to be there. So so then they maybe make another subsidiary cluster in which they can maybe grow up. Anyway, fascinating topic. Uh, thanks a lot for bringing that up. And the metaverse is definitely um, has a lot of similarities to, to, to cities, but it has new, it's just a new level of scale. And that's maybe what also I think why parametrism is the only methodology who can possibly cope with that. I mean, algorithmic design, data-driven design, uh, managing huge numbers in huge in complexities. I mean, don't ask uh, you know, Leon Creer or <laughs> David Chipperfield. <laughs> To you know, they will just be they're they're just they're just uh, running into this complexity barrier without any means and tools. So that's why it's parametrism in the widest sense is is the only the only paradigm and epo epochal style which is a chance here. So just following the discussion, so um, I totally agree on your statement about the tools, the technologies that are able to encompass the big data and the complexity of the society and the network and etc. But just uh, in terms of styles, do you think it's possible for future style to emerge from a cluster of designers with almost like an agent-based system with not to say lower intelligence, but less of self-awareness, but build um uh, diff uh, different ways of interconnection, different... Yeah, I mean, look, what I think is this. I mean, I'll, I will show it tomorrow. So yeah. we have paradigm, the, let's say parametrism is the big epochal style. Yeah. Within that, before you have to say, well, I'm announcing a new epochal style, before yeah. you say parametrism is over, long live, whatever, there is more likely and the chance is to have subsidiary styles within the umbrella. For instance, in modernism, you started with the white modernism, you had rationalism versus what they call functionalism, which was you know, Hugo Herring organic architecture. Then you went into, so you have a series of subsidiary approaches, you have brutalism, then you move into metabolism, high tech, Foster Rogers is still fully, I mean, if, I'm, if I would analyze all these projects within the positive and negative heuristics of Modernism, they're all fully within the big paradigm of modernism. They're modernist, no doubt, in terms of um, separation, specialization, repetition as the key categories of modernism. You find that in Richard Rogers' works of the 1980s, as well as in Locke Busey's works of the 1920s. So you have a lot of potential there. And so as in parametrism, we also, we had foldism, blobism, swarmism, tectonism, and there will be others, um, for instance, I've started to identify, and some people who think that they're something different from parametricism, and want, for instance, I have, you know, discretism, something which Neil Leach was promoting, Jill Ratson and the, disc, the new discrete. Sorry, there are subsidiary styles of parametricism in my classification. It's not that I want to be that all-encompassing. I think I have good arguments for that. The same as things which happened in 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 sci arc with respect to um, object oriented ontology. That I'm, I have a whole article, you know, if you want to read it, eight thousand words of analyzing that and how how it is, how it is a subsidiary style of parametrism. So, and actually reworking some themes, forgotten themes of early parametrism. So that's what I expect. I expect new subsidiary styles. What would it take to say there's something outside parametrism? It's really something which I don't think the metaverse delivers, not soon, a real transformation into another socioeconomic, political and societal paradigm. Uh, and maybe a totally new technology. And I'm sure if AI is that. So AI and the metaverse, I think not, not necessarily. Something we don't know. I'm not saying, and of course, parametrism will be coming to an end. 
uh, if there is that radical transformation. And, uh, but I don't think it's something you can invent. So there's no, nobody could have invented a new style of architecture with any credibility in 1930, nor in 1940, nor in 1950. You know, it has to really, it ha that has to come from the, the environment, the societal environment. There's always, and that's my thing, which I show tomorrow, that there's this alignment of the great epochal styles of architecture with socioeconomic epochs, which obviously are coming external, the external reference. And then the internal reference is a style, but the external reference is, is a, cannot be ignored. So it's not something you cannot come up with a new style if the, in, basically because you would compete with 30 years of the brightest and best working through the con external reference, the new conditions and bringing up solutions. There's no chance for you to <laughs> have something and it needs to come from outside and then there will be that flourishing. Then you, then, then the game is up. Who is going, what shall we do now? Wow, how are we going to respond to that? And it's going to be many different versions, many different attempts. It's going to be, again, there's going to be the postmodernists, the neo <laughs> historicists, the deconstructivists, et cetera, et cetera. Or like in the modernism, yeah, there will be the, the eclecticists and the expressionists, et cetera, et cetera, and the art nouveaus. That's the transitional styles will be opening up. I don't see that yet. What I see coming is a new subsidiary style. <coughs> which I don't have a name for, obviously. <laughs> and I don't know what it's looked like. I have some glit, uh, you know, kind of some kind of guess, I could guess that that emerges through that, maybe through the metaverse as a new, as a new challenge, which I don't think is a new socioeconomic system. So it's gonna so be a I, subsidiary style. Yep. So for those subsidiary styles, so just, um, so, instead from a theory uh, historian or um, point of view, but just from a designer point of view, uh, do you think it, they need to be self-conscious like the like pioneers in the modernism or in postmodernism where they proclaim their concept and et cetera? Or um, let's say back, back to one of earlier arguments, they can be just this kind of agent of part of a uh, different form of network, but yeah, no, of being course. Look, I mean, I, that's, uh, that's very nice. Yeah. The good, good question. You anticipate what I was talking about. So my theory of style, I have active versus passive styles, yeah. and I have active, and then comes we move into active reflective styles, and those are the ones who are explicitly operating with the concept of style, with the self identification, with the manifesto style, self conscious promotion of the innovations. That's of course they they. That is not happening instantly. Um, that happens along the way. But I think the sooner it happens, the better. I mean, you need to first have look back into something to, 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 to realize something important is going on and something persistent is going on. Uh, uh, something which also has many people getting interested already. You need to see something like this fermenting. Like I said, you know, deconstructivism was collects work of a prior decade and the same so that, that i mean and, and it will initially be unselfconscious initially there will be you know little instance maybe the um it's interesting that the deconstructivists most of them thought they were uh, modernists still some of them thought of themselves of postmodernists, and they were doing something new which had to then be called out and was called deconstructivist so so yeah so it will be first unselfconscious but i think it's certainly advantageous at some point for the progress and progression of the discipline that this becomes explicit and becomes called out because then you, you draw attention to here is something new and you also challenge what is it you have to start defining it pinpointing the points of innovation and you challenge to say what's good about this why is it not just a novelty we should dismiss? Why is it actually innovation? What's good about it? What's more performative and functioning? That's incredibly helpful. Um, and if you don't do that, then for instance, it, it's much slower because a lot of people do, don't notice it. They don't know why they should pay attention to it. They don't recognize that these four, these different things which are going here actually are doing something quite similar. Uh, even the people themselves don't notice that they're doing something new. So I think it's very healthy because I was in the Zaha 
gestation and the, we did radically new work, but you know who showed us that we're doing radically new work? Kipnis. I learned that we're doing and what we were doing and how radically new it was from Jeff Kipnis. And while we internally, we were using the, let's say the arguments and tropes and talks of REM. We were doing REM speak and then we switched to parametrics, what I call later on, let's say the folding Greg Lynn and Kipnis speak, I mean, it was within minutes basically, because we're talking 1991 at the time when these first publications came out in assemblage and then and then um, in the folding and architecture AD 93, we already, I, you know, Jeff had arrived at the AA and I made, you know, I was electrified right away. And he came to the office and basically picked up features and run with them at the AA. And, and I, and, but he put the voiceover and the categories and pinpointed what's new, what's different and potent, why this isn't just another, OMA project and why it isn't a Niemeyer project. This was incredibly important, that explicitness. And it was also nice for Zaha. So we, we, she was the youngest deconstructivist and the oldest, let's say, folding and parametricist. So we shifted to the new generation and that's why we took off. I think, but the, the importance of theory and explicit naming out, because yes, I used the phrase parametricism, but there was something before, which I think was too limited. And folding and architecture is just one, trope one mechanism and that was also it wasn't very potent it didn't say he is a new epochal style it was just it wasn't you know so 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 but i think that's incredibly important and i realized the potency of it and you know and and what, what i mean obviously jeff did bring not enough because he was just bringing let's say a formalism language let's say conceptual categories which are pointing to formal conditions and at the same, and we needed to also bring in the functional conceptions, which are underpinned by this. I mean, I would say, you know, who had the, you had, who had the insight as at the same time as I had the insight, Fernand, uh, Alejandro Sarapolo. He was with working still within OMA and he discovered post-Fordism tradition. <laughs> You know, uh, and it was reading David Harvey and the post discourse. So we at the same time, which is basically a socioeconomic, socioeconomic dynamics underpinning uh, what what you know what was the burgeoning parametrism. So he he the two of us got it, and I think it was important. And that was we were both at the A, and we were, the founding of DOL made sense. And when we exhibited the first time, we had our staff right next to FOA unit, and then was Ben von Berkel unit. He also was more prone. So the Europeans, because they were coming out of the Dutch context, OMA, Binimas, MBR, DVV, we had all that, you know, the, the, the tradition of radical functionalism, data scapes. So I think the AA was, we, was stronger than the American was a purely formalism side of things. So we were at the AA, the AA was an incredibly potent powerhouse in the, in the, let's say, second half of the 90s. And we were very, very strongly communicating across between DRL and then, then the diploma units, which, which were the undergraduate units in the, in the school, as well as MTech coming in and so on and so forth. So that, but it's very important to have an explicit, exp making explicit uh, quite, that's why I'm saying, for instance, in my political theory, I'm also I'm emphasizing markets, which is the kind of just what happens, what people are doing freely, individually and separately, and they generate structures and price systems and competitive trajectories, but then we need discourses. I think we need discourses to, 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 to empower each individual actor, but also we can step back and, and, and critique overall trends and tendencies. And we can take up the position uh, of, of, or let's say the overall trajectory of the discipline. So that's, you know, I'm somebody who is, wants to speak for the discipline as a whole. I'm, I love to see all my competitors flourish and all my ex-students flourish. I'm not only somebody who is, you know, the, I mean, misunderstood. I mean, it's nasty, I, you know, to, to think that parametrism and is, 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 let's say, kind of um, marketing strategy for Zadid Architect. And that's not who I am, who I'm, what I'm thinking. And as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I don't want to be recognized as I did architects in terms of what the output, 
I want to be recognized as feminism through our output. Thank you. Thank you very much for your detailed explanation. I have two questions from the, the students, the audience. Um, well, Mary, um, would you like to, to ask the question by yourself or uh, you have the permission to talk? Um, yes, hello, and thank you for the lecture. So, um, I'm, I'm going to read it out. Uh, I was just wondering, how, is the, how does the internal reference for, or form uh, generate the response to the changing social function while being a fixed structure? Um, I'm trying to understand better your lecture. So, uh, for okay. example, looking at the theory versus evidence being internal or external, does form get disproven by the changing function of the project through its program? For example, industrial centers becoming art centers. And so my question actually regards the contradiction between the notion of architecture being in a way submissive to the flux of globalized style, its perception uh, by a certain social group, and the evident creation of the visual code that is being followed by the social group of similar preferences. Well, it's interesting, yeah, you're, you're quite right. So and the external references need to be reckoned with. And the, inter the internal references, actually what we, the means by which we recognize external selection pressures, demands, requirements, criteria of success out in the world, it's a medium of form, giving form. I mean, and, and, and so of course, if we fail, uh, that should be re recognized with the field and we need to adapt our ways of generating form. And we also allow in each project, of course, the external pressures to select the particular form, probably, it will always be a form of, for instance, parameters and tectonism within our, because I think that's where we have the greatest chance of matching the external demands. But at a certain point, uh, if, 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 the, if these resources we bring to it, that the stylistic resources through which we generate form, if they don't contain, that universe of search doesn't contain the solution, then we need to switch and try to find other ways of generating form. That happens when you have to transition to a new style. So I think that that a a a some of the modernists will find it hard to find good solutions for very irregular sites with many different adjacent buildings who need to be connected to with complex internal programs. They have to violate both you know the requirements of external embeddedness and internal inter interconnectedness, and so they lose their competitions. <laughs> for instance, uh, rightly so. So yes, the, so so um, the forms will be critiqued ultimately um, through this uh, these external pressures. And by the way, that's internally represented in the code of utility. So we're also trying to, in each case of the project, we analyze um, um, you know those aspects we can and have time to, the most important ones, we would use the code of utility and we run our analytics, we run our simulation, we, we measure out and compare and et cetera, and try to think through the social process. That's the way we critique and change and adapt the form, but we usually adapt it within the style we're working with and that's basically where everybody's doing it. Um, even those who don't talk about form, that's what's always been criticizing OMA for. They all we talk about the program they never problematize a formal repertoire and formal universe. Uh, and they're just suspicious a priori of anything which isn't direct to listen. <laughs> I mean, they have moved beyond that. Thinking that this cannot help with the, you know, thinking they have a strong formal a priori, which is quite limited and restrictive so that they do work within the style and they do work within constraints. Uh, and if they don't talk about the form, that means they don't realize the limitations. They don't open it up. Because talking about form and showing preferences about form, you at least bring the formal discussion to the table and ask yourself, what else, what other forms could I do? What other formalisms could I bring to bear? And that's only healthy. That only makes the, the process more rational. Because as I said, formal repertoires are problem-solving repertoires. And if I have a very small toolbox, I have a very <laughs> I'm generating crude solutions. So that's the point on that. But I mean, if you're talking about different preference groups, cliques of preference, and that they I cater for them, et cetera. 
well, no, we don't do that. So um, we are in the privileged position, but also, you know, that's particular, that's the attitude of avant-garde. When we have a mission, we have manifesto projects. We don't just cater for what the masses or what the clients, the paying clients wants. They can't purchase us and then we're doing what they like in a superficial way. We, we bring solutions which we think are competent and best for them, the way we understand their social processes. And they think they would want this, that, and the other, meaning pointing to a finite finished spatial solution, but they are not speaking fully informed because they don't have in view all the other formal opportunities and solutions that could help express their social processes better. So the, I don't think we cater towards these clients. We, cl clients come to us who are inherently, some more get a sense that we are doing we are, on the, we are doing uh, efficient works. They've been to some of our projects. They love some of the look and feel, but also the life, the living, breathing activity within the buildings. And they also come giving us the respect and giving us, uh, respecting us as the experts that we are in charge of how they're the brief and how we translate as our business. So we don't, we don't do that. And I think there's a strong case made for market leadership. Market validation in the end is very important. In the end, if nobody buys our stuff, if everybody is wants something else, we dry up and we, 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 we are failures in the history of the world. And that means also failures in the history of architecture. But uh, we can be off of market leadership and we can be proactive and then find buyers and find buy-in. We don't necessarily do market research, what, what everybody wants. We saying what everybody needs. That's the entrepreneurship, the creative entrepreneur comes up with new solutions and pain points and products because they see that things could be done otherwise. I mean, the, the, you know, the problems they identify, the only problem is in comparison to the new solutions they have put on the table because otherwise people might have noticed that they have a problem because there's a certain fatalism, well, what else can we do? So I strongly believe in that market leadership and that's the avant-garde attitude. And that's the thing which in the end, if you want to be famous and put, uh, let's say in inverted commas, successful and have a chance to be very successful, that's the attitude you take. You don't follow tastes and run after your clients. I mean, uh, I, and I prefer that. I mean, it's good. Our strategy worked. We've been growing and growing and growing, you know, from five to 50 to 500. But, uh, you know, maybe at this stage in the market, if you want to be 5,000 people, you, then you can't do what we're doing. Then you have to follow and do all sorts of things, totally unprincipled, selling you what everybody would want. And uh, uh, then you're neither part of the history of architecture nor part of the discourse of architecture. A lot of your solutions will be basically semi-vernaculars. I mean, then that's the way I think my attitude is. So I don't believe in these. And I don't believe necessarily i would i would say this that yes there might be pockets of social life around the world with, that don't necessarily yet benefit from permatism maybe their work that they kind of disenfranchised disconnected to the world economy they're not they they, they live making say kind of a an, an like older eras they're not connected up to the contemporary condition it's no point. I mean, they, they, they wouldn't anyway wouldn't be able to afford our fees, but also we probably wouldn't have the solutions for them because they, they just need to catch up and have you know, watertight shelters and flowing water, etc. So, and, there's, and then that's the extreme case. And then the other cases where you still have big industrial manufacturing plants and spaces where there's more the production side of things whereas region development marketing and so on is happening in other centers, they still can live under modernism. So there's an uneven development condition. To that extent, you can say there are different groups, different parts of society, different air, arenas where, you, where the urgency of adopting permanentism, tectonism, et cetera, is not very strong. But ultimately, I feel that there's probably something positive to be brought for everybody. I don't want to be, I think that should, in the inspiration anyway, use of universally, applicable like modernism was and even under modernism there were still kind of backward vernacular 
forms of life in world commerce, but the gist and tendency of universalization, I think, is there. But of course, we now have much more diversified. And I don't think that if you have different zones and different roles in the world division of labor, different types of industries, different, you know, the research development, the financial sector versus artistic and art district versus the, they're quite different cultures around the world in terms of the world division of labor. You know, there's the biomedical and there's, these are the science scientists, but these are the humanities campuses. They're quite different. All of these cultures, these are the cultures I recognize and you have to be versatile and culturally adaptive with parametricism. I think parametricism is relevant to all of these. <clears throat> to most of these, except for, let's say, you know, sweatshops in the outskirts of, of Mumbai, these lives are similar to Fordist, uh, life or pre-Fordist. I don't know yet. I mean, that, that's not, but the tendency would be, what I don't believe in is, for instance, national identities and national cultures. I don't think they exist. They exist as residues or folkloric issues of pride. But I do believe, obviously, that they're climatic condition so we have we have, which which are differentiated strongly topographic climatic conditions which will imprint on the physiognomy of the built environment and then uh, there will be these cultural differences the differences between uh what, what you know community of scientists versus community of artists versus a community of you know more engineering and fabrication oriented more marketing research and the finance sector there's there's there there are different cultures but they're all 21st century post for this network is culture, they also share something. You know, they're all, they're all, uh, you know, they're all, ha they're on, um, somehow on Facebook and Twitter and in, in various degrees or Instagram and, and uh, CNN and et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's certain protocols, universal protocols of interaction and mores and mores and, and so on, which are universal, but then there's these culturally differentiations. And I think paramedicine could speak to all of them. So I don't believe that there are different groups which want different styles. I make one exception, retirement homes or retirement resorts. Once you pull away, and I don't think that's such a huge market. I see more and more that people don't retire, never retire, certain in the knowledge economy. An American professor, emeritus, they continue right? at 80, 90, which I'm going to meet with Robert Middleton. Uh, architectural theories at the AA and then and, and Columbia University and still working on the next book on the 20th and 21st century architecture. He's visiting me. He's 90 years old. Look at Moan Chomsky and look at all the old guys, you know, Foster <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and, and Warren Buffett and, 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 and Robert Murdoch, blah, 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 blah. And that becomes a condition to the knowledge economy. So I don't think my father was, you know, is, is 90 and is still working. So what, what's going on here is, but I would make the exception if you wanted to you know, pull away and say that you've made enough money and you and you and you're withdrawing into resort somewhere, then you can have your your sweet nostalgic style. You know, it's a low performance. Then you can you can you can you can sit back and enjoy whatever you love art deco um, or you love you know love a pristine modernism. I'm not against that, but that's not part of the living, breathing, you know, progressing, productive. Uh, world society that's the kind of way saying well i let you guys continue and i'm going to relax and enjoy my 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 old-fashioned aesthetic sensibilities but they shouldn't use those to 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 impose their taste on the next headquarters of their company which made them rich uh okay um well daniela i just want to uh, follow up a, a quick question, which is more related to what uh, Merrick just asked, and then we, we go to your question as, as maybe at the end of uh, uh, as the end of this session. So, Patrick, uh, I, I just want to ask a question. Uh, uh, it's also re related to the relationship between form and utility, and also related to what Merrick just asked. Um, well, I, I, I see. Um, well, also, you you mentioned in the earlier lectures. Parametric system in, in certain way is a is kind of combining uh, the formalistic paradigm uh, in the United States and also the European tradition of of, of uh, space event, right? So 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 in the later uh, case, uh, we all know the the famous concept cross function, 
uh, proposed by Bernardo Trimi, which is kind of encouraging people to uh, to to kind of break the the the, the pre-described utility of space. Um, so I, I I want to 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 ask. Yeah, what absolutely, you and that's on the side of utility, right? That's on the side of programmatic functionality, social functionality, where he proposed that, and that's the condition which we should always consider. Um, which, I mean, what I, for me, what was striking at the time, so when I first saw Bernard Schumi's Parc de la Villette, I was mm -hmm. a student, a first year student in Stuttgart, 1983. Second year, I saw this competition and wow. And it was not only me, it was my, the whole studio, everybody. We saw this competition. The next day we were on to, you know, layering radically yeah. different I systems. I mean, and it's interesting. Sometimes, let's say there's a few of these innovations which people come up with and they are just electrifying. They're real step changes, something radically mm -hmm. new, which nobody has thought of before doing with that explicit as the self-conscious and radicality. And then it literally takes, you know, a few weeks and the whole student body is fully onto it. That's the same, by the way, later on, the symbol was, was when we had the, the, kind of the discovery of folding and so on. That was yeah. literally, I was at Noah's Stu, I was a teacher at the time, and I saw every teacher I've ever seen in Columbia, Harvard, and switching within, within, within the, let's say, a day after the publication of uh, Folding and Architecture. But this was a Chumi amendment, was this monumental, exhilarating thing. And yes, it represents, it's, but it's also, it's a formal strategy. But underneath that is the pro cross programming, basically that you layer and overlap different programs. They intersect. They have maybe the, each of their formal straighter structure, they, which they come along. But particularly in a public space, you can have simultaneously overlay different reference systems. And I interpret it directly, functionally, in a sense of the park that you, you know that you have. You have the path cutting through, you have the point grid of pavilions, which different things, you have the spaces, the circle, square, and, and you, you have multiple audiences. And each audience follows one of the structures primarily, mm -hmm. and they can all do that simultaneously, and they don't disturb each other too much. It's a bit like you have that basketball, that sports fields in the schoolyard, where they're painting on the basketball field, the volleyball field, the, and the tennis court, and if, yeah. all in different colors. And of course, but now the idea is with Chumi, let's, they all play at the same time, <laughs> you know? So, and I think, uh, uh, and I think that's the condition of the contemporary city. That's the condition of the, and, and I find most interesting, the, the contemporary, the, the at the time, contemporary corporate organizational principle, for instance, of the matrix structure. And I've looked, mm -hmm. and for me, from this idea of superimposition, which was a formal concept, primarily in, in the way it was in Eisenman. By the way, Chumi brought it home, but Eisenman did it first. As a formalist, Chumi did it then more, more Con more radically and much more conspicuous. So if you looked at the Eisenman, let's say the Venice project, you could have overlooked it. Mm -hmm. There's no way you could have overlooked what's going on in the, in the La Villette. Yeah. Anyway, so, so but Chumi has had this cross-programming agenda and I interpreted this way as a multi, multiple audience simultaneously doing, having different programmatics intersecting. And it could be time-based, it could be simultaneous. And I think it's very important. That's the condition of contemporary social institutions, the city, but also into individual corporations. So the way I brought into corporation, you know, what you have, usually you have actually a simultaneously multiple affiliate. So you're part of a team mm -hmm. on a project, but you're also part of a functional division or department. But in the project, there are people coming from different departments. They're intersecting in that project and you belong both to one of several projects and you be one of several departments. And there are two reference systems which overlap, which, which you are located in socially in terms of a double affiliation 
And you could have a triple affiliation as well thrown into this. Maybe you're part of a competency or a research network at the same time, not only a project network and a department. You have two or three bosses, two or three points where you see your colleagues. And how would you implement that in space? The modernist, you would have to decide which one is primary. Okay, order the floors by department and then break apart the projects. The projects have no registration. Or I'm building them by project and then the departments have no registration. If you do Chumi's condition or the superposition game, you can register all, several or two or three simultaneous. So that's for me was a very striking say, validation of the profundity and pertinence of that new formal possibility, that new formalism of superimposition, which was one of the major innovations of deconstructivism. And it totally aligned with what the contemporary condition of, you call it, you know, cross crawling is a more general term, for instance, the matrix organization in corporate. And what was really very important that um, business organizations and there's other things what's happened was the blurred boundary. It's not only are these super but the, but the department have in between that you, 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 you're more or less. So it's gradient is basically moving from set theory to fuzzy logic where all the sets are with degrees of belonging. Yeah. And so, so I, and this is the next, there was deconstructism and there's a habit, Zara had that and then parameticism had that. But I maintained the superimposition bit, which somehow Greg and the other parameticism left behind. I'm seeing it always cumulatively. Yeah. Anyway, so I think it's a very profound example of um, not that's utility, that's hyper utility. Yeah. It's not the questioning, it's a new concept. That's what I said a new concept of program, of utility, of it's a new functional heuristics. And that's what I said the new style has always a formal and functional heuristics. And because if you don't have a new functional heuristic, I mean, the, otherwise there's no motivation. Otherwise, there's la polar. Otherwise, forget it. Don't do it. Why would you do it? Because it's complex. It generates a lot of difficulties. It generates a lot of problems, potentially, in terms of construction and so on. If there is no functional raison that, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's, it's like if, 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 well, if we, if you truly uh, approach the, 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 the condition of, those kind of uh, hyper utilities through the form of super imposition, maybe parametric is more like um, kind of taking the position of post-structuralist flow, uh, fluid and gradient kind of those kind of um, uh, uh, formal style and, and also formal paradigm to, to, to aiming for the, for the same contemporary um, yeah, you see, that's where I, is another of those moments, let's say, where I think that the movement of parametricism had a series of very strong innovations. You know, single surface, the, 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 the gradient. And, and the thing is, what I had to push for hard, and I think it is arriving, and we, you know, and it's, but it's hard that we also maintain this idea of interpenetration and layering as well. But mm -hmm. so I've been always saying multiple you know, the correlation of subsystems, it's not only one uh, uh, differentiation of a system, you have, you should have multiple systems, they should each have their transformation and then, and then they should be correlated. So I was saying, basically, we have these subsystems. First of all, they need to be differentiated, which they weren't. For instance, the Chumi grid, point grid was just a grid. It has no transformation, squeezing gradient, the individual pavilions, yes, they were all discrete and different. So it wasn't modernist, it was postmodernist. They were all unique, but on a grid. The parameters is, and then you had the, the, the big circle, triangles, cube. What is interesting about not they're broken, that you can make a cube, a rect, so, or let's say a square, without closing it. If you do yeah. these two halves and leave a gap or two yeah. angles, you can, you can implement the square, you can have broken figures, open figures, because we have, that's the Gestalt psychology thing. We complete them, we see them anyway. So they're there completed through our cognitive pattern recognition. We don't need a literally closed triangle. 
that was an important insight for me as well. That was in there. That, but you know, so that came out of, uh, you know, actually the superposition game came out of Gestalt psychology, originally mm -hmm. through people like Kepesh. I mean, actually, you know, Moholy Notch, Kepesh, uh, Colin Rowe, Eisenman, Chumi. So also to trace that, and I was always using it also as a parametric figuration, the multiple superposition, and looking at that as an issue of an, an issue of the phenomenological project, because it's a challenge to see all these things. Because if they if they, they they start might abstract and kill each other off, so that none of them is there at the end. So that becomes a complexity, becomes a phenomenological project, a problematizing cognitive tractability. No, so so yeah, so what I'm going back to with, with when I was studying, when I was teaching at Columbia University in 93, so that's the moment of arrival for folding and architecture. And Greg was teaching there for the first time, Jesse was teaching there, we were all there, we seeing what, what's happening. And when the publication was happening, let's say, bang, anybody who was there who did other things, you know, Stan Allen, Hani Rashid, Bill and Shulan, they did different things. I mean, this was, you know. Uh, Bang, the convergence was literally within less than a year. FOA, you know, Alejandro and Vashid, they were OMA, every converged in the, in a single year. That, 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 you know, so the power of that was so convincing. But I wanted to say, so what we did with, with so we had all the layers. We had, we had a hyper chumi. We had maybe 10 layers, literally, because we, we had a studio of 12. Actually, everybody had to do a layer. So, but the next thing was each of the layers was not isotropic. So it was parametric, it was, it was squeezed, they were differentiating, and they were not just indifferent, superimposed, but once one comes in on the other, the other, they have to respond, they have to resonate, they have to inflect to, when you take the other one off and you look back at the original one, there's the imprint, there's the inflection there, so there's a resonance. These were the things, what I call correlation later on in the, in the principles of parametrism, differentiation, correlation, as a key category, so it was already in, in that project. I mean, it looked very chaotic, it was very primitive. We had we used both hand drawings and computational representations. It was more 2D than 3D, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But it that was I think the key thing was I was always emphasized, which wasn't naturally. A lot of the paramedicine projects were just single, easy, beautiful gradient. There was no superimposition or interpenetration or multiple systems. So that's something which I think is very important because otherwise. We, we, we adding a new innovation, let's say the blurring of boundaries and the gradual transformation, soft transitions, and we leaving behind a very potent and powerful uh, innovation which deconstructivism had. So I was definitely determined and only bringing that in and all it, it would be, you would be potent uh, a true innovation superiority. But if we lose some and gain some, we might not have been super, you know. And the other thing which was from coming from deconstructivism was what Greg put, put a name on, what he called multiple affiliation. And they also did, and, 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 and Baram and, and Jeff did a very nice project doing that in a museum. And this was also mid nineties. So they had, what deconstructivism had the idea that you have an urban site, and you have many different site conditions. And that's where you draw the lines in. I mean, we work like this in Zaha in the, in, the early, in, the mid, in the late 80s. So you always have the site and you keep bringing in geometric trajectories from all sites. In particular, if these sites were not an homogenous field, but oftentimes in a city, there's a modernist building here. There's a bit of historic city here. There's an So that game of mining, you know, the, the site for complexities of surrounding and that, that, that leads to these complex, that was maintained in parametrism as well. Mm -hmm. It's a, this idea of multiple affiliation. Yeah. And it was now done with, 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 with more of a, not only lines and it was an object which was morphing itself to different, become a, to different side, become similar to the constant different side, maybe making connection. So there is a lot of continuity between deconstructivism and parametrism rightly understood or and, 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 and of course, there was an enormous amount of polemic killing off of the fathers, as I said yesterday as well. But we have to take this with, with, with Kumgranum Salo. We, we, we can't take that literally. I mean, 
Uh, and by the way, I mean, of course, and then some people translate, transformed. So let's say the, the Eisenman office became a parametric parametricism office and not a deconstructivism office in the same level as the architect. So they, those two, and even later Himmelblau also migrated out and, but they kept strong aspects of deconstructivist ruggedness in their, in, in their oeuvre for much longer. And it's similar with Gary. So it's also interesting that it's not only the whole new generation within a year, but then gradually over the years, the, these protagonists, including OMA, to some extent, when some of the protagonists, when you know, with Vinnie Maas was working and 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 and, and Alejandro, etc., work, there was some, there's a lot of OMA projects which are parametricism projects or hybrid projects, like the GC libraries, single surface over you know 20 over 15 floors. So 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 that's what that's why I experienced that convergence so strongly not only did the new generation be up you know with, within a month onto the trajectory leaving everything else behind but all the big the bigger stars all came along to some extent i mean less complete yeah, that's, that's really phenomenal yeah okay um so sorry, sorry uh, daniel I, I think we can go to your question um but it's quite late maybe just um, yeah, one last question for you, from you. Okay, um, so I'm changing my question as I listen to you, Patrick. I guess my question really has to do with authorship. Um, for instance, in, in the field of architecture, what happens is there are some manifesto projects by specific people or teams led by specific people. And then when a practice grows around them, not just Sahadid architects, but I've seen this in many firms, there's still this sense that that one person out of how many hundreds is still the author. And I think the same thing has kind of happened with the other places of architecture in the architecture sphere, even though that's, that's an internal discourse, um, which is that there's this perception that parametricism was made up by you because you named it. And I think you've elaborated a lot in this discussion, um, like how it kind of cohered and you've, you finally kind of retrospectively like uh, named it and cohered it further. Um, but I guess I just maybe make this very uh, like visible, like just really address like the distinction between like a manifesto triggered social movement and a style that emerges over many years and is finally cohered theoretically. And further, uh, and and it keeps evolving actually, because parametricism is not just something that happened in an instance in time. You've even named like sub styles, uh, you know, like blobism and foldism and tectonism. But the continued evolution of parametricism is very important to understand in my mind. So if you could just kind of dis distinguish between these things and kind of dispel the myth that parametricism was somehow a made up style and it belongs to you. Yeah, I mean, I've mean, said it many times. I've said it from the very beginning. <laughs> so, but people don't read <laughs> so enough and they pick up you know, headlines and don't, don't look at the, the text. So it's, it's obviously in the first manifesto has already formulated exactly that. So yeah, you know, and I'm, you know, I don't want to be an imposter and you claim everybody else's work. And uh, so, it also is important for the credibility of the whole thing that this is a collective movement. It had a lot of, you know, convergent actors and a lot of buy-in and protagonists and also it evolved fantastically well. I mean, from the early Form Z kind of <laughs> sketches into, into you know, you know in these beautiful, for instance, build, completed buildings and pavilions on, on the way. Well, that's very clear. I mean, authorship on the large firms as well. There's, so obviously we make an effort to have credit lists. I mean, there is, of course, a role for a leaders in a company to give, let's say, overall direction and will potentially shift direction or give a signal or trying to, sh it's, these are super tankers, not easy to shift. <laughs> and also everything has a lot of skills. So using something like code and the shifting it gradually the super tanker from into into more and more of tectonism, and of course you have individual also individual creativity and they're named on the credit list which are published when we have the chance to. But uh, so so authorship shouldn't be in, in, in 
you know, is a more broader concept and it's not so much really about who did it and, and who, who receives the, you know, the accolades of gratitude, etc., and, and, and who receives the statute, etc. It is a, it's a point of reference. It's a good shortcut. Um, it, it, it's something, it is only so many names you can circulate in the discourse of architecture as markers meaning something you can refer to and people know what you're talking about. And uh, that's where names come in, in individual authors. And also the, you know, the, it's, there is a degree of taking responsibility publicly for something and standing up for it and being an address for defending it, et cetera, which, which there's a certain specialization within the company. And, and so, so that's what I would say. I mean, I don't think we have any illusions and a lot of people know, and yes, there is sometimes, a, it, it is annoying Sometimes if there is this focus on this one person, and even if you had teams and partners, Herzog and Demeron, and there are many others like Coop Himmelblau, they, they don't use the names and it used to be, you know, Wolf and Helmut, and in the, but everybody's focused on Wolf. Why? Well, because he was maybe the more charismatic leader. Maybe he had more uh, eloquence and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and it's Jack and the, you know, so, so even if you have these, these names already out there or a neutral name or, or maybe it's been it's REM and REM only, et cetera, et cetera. Although Elia was there and so on. So that's a, you know, and I, you know, inverted commas suffer from this as well. You know, when, when and this general media attention was, 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 the light was only shining on Zaha. Internally in the field and so on. I mean, I wasn't really suffering from at all, but uh, it, it is sometimes also maybe, uh, it is also a burden to be, to be targeted and continuously being challenged to, to defend things. So that's what I would say with authorship. It's in, in the similar to parametrism, maybe, um, yes, it is this movement and maybe I'm over credited for it. I mean, they've never claimed that, but it becomes a convenient reference. And of course it takes a particular shape, particular emphasis. I make my particular contributions and innovations within it and particular stresses. So he then said, you know, the parametricism of Patrick Schumacher, that these, these and these claims come forward. It's more explicit. Uh, but you can also use it, of course, to, to refer to the whole movement. And so I think that's part of it is maybe the impression that this is maybe just a convenient reference to, pin, to, to connect up rather than people really believing I don't know what people really it's like, uh, or want to believe. I mean, of course, clients want to see the the the, the, the leader. Maybe they have they over attribute, particularly in our case of Soviet architects. It, it's definitely so that we've been always very very oriented towards free circulating creativity and people doing having a lot of scope and control. And that's why our work is so diverse, versatile and diverse. I don't, I think there might be other firms like, I'm just assuming Frank Gehry or so, or Liebeskin maybe. And I heard it from Calatrava. I mean, they're also then the herb was very, very limited where there is actually the fact that they inverted commas tr claim or do, I don't know, do everything themselves or control way more closely the product and then you clearly when you're a client you need to see frank there's no point in seeing anybody else you know? but i don't think that's the recipe for lasting sustainable big success so i think i guess I think so my question is, yeah sorry i guess so my question really i mean i use that as an analogy what happens with a, a star architect but really what i'm more interested in is the fact that it's happening kind of internally in inside the discourse of architecture where, you know, I mean, I've, I've read so many of uh, those huge social media posts she used to make and just hundreds of comments from architects, from theoreticians, from, uh, you know, critics inside the architecture world. Um, and a lot of them were phrased in this way, like aiming at a critique of parametricism as a fabricated thing that really, uh, was fabricated by you. And yeah, I, I mean, well, strange. I mean, 
considering guess, that the I mean the part of it is I mean it, I think it's it has it's been so I what I've seen that the, the phrase and concept circulates widely and is widely used without necessarily referring back to me just using it to, to refer to something which has now been associated with that name so I think in this case it worked as a, as a label I partly maybe it has to do with uh, that some of the other protagonists don't like to use the na- label I mean that I think don't want to own it because it maybe it's coming from somebody else or they, they, they feel fixed. I mean that 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 is also I think a slightly irrational hesitancy. I mean I understand it, but but it's really um, more making explicit what they implicitly implicitly adhere to, and usually adhere to 100% in their work. Um, yeah, I think that's. I mean, look, there's no point in much complaining about it. I I hope that. Um, the 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 culture the discursive culture in the field is 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 you know is evolving and um, and of course social media not 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 the medium we must primarily look at you know we can also look at um, you know people lecturing people writing and uh, publishing articles people publishing books of course there's also mis misconstrual I mean it's still a contested field and I'm getting a lot of criticism. Most, but not so not so much that it isn't real, but uh, the misunderstanding that this work is f- aligned with, um, let's say, unsavory corporate interests too much, with with the with the with with questionable aspects of capitalism, that it is, um, um, let's say, complicit in in an in an in in an kind of questionable, inequitable, inequitable uh, socioeconomic system, etc., and that we are pandering towards the powerful and rich, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Which we, that's more of the um, is something I've been battling more. And there's books like the Politics of Parametricism, and I've been speak. I mean, they invited me gladly onto the conference, and I could in, produce an article. But I see a lot of also recent books. On you know the neoliberalism and, and you know and the critique of neoliberalism coming within architecture and I'm usually the sort of exemplar of and the work of Zadiatics of this kind of complicit kind of work and I think that's I mean that's a more deeper um, ideological battle that's where I also in a way had to give up the initial defense was this politics. Political discourse is not directly moving into architecture. We shouldn't fight our political debates and battles inside the field and let that take over all the airtime. That strategy of rebuttal didn't work. So also I have to come up and engage with political argument and discourses and, and, and um, relativize this and challenge, let's say, left critiques or suspect of what their recipes are and 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 what they what kind of socioeconomic dynamics they would um, um, uh, promote and usually there's there's very little it's relatively negative a negative only critique there's not much constructive critique and and of course we also have to realize I mean I've discussed it I think the other day I mean in uh, actually in the context of the AA there is true that at the beginning of these new paradigms, new styles, new ways of working. The, the, first of all, we will address those sites which are most urgent and advanced in terms of major knowledge economy hubs, very innovative, potent firms, companies, and maybe cultural institutions and elite universities who are part of these clusters. They are one, the ones who are drawing us in. And I think it's also the, the, the places where the, the potency of this new style and paradigm can be shown off most. And of course, initially, uh, because the industry hasn't been geared up towards this and it's still untested, et cetera, fees are higher, construction costs are higher, and all of this plays into this notion that this is part of an inequity, inequity society. But I think we have to recognize that that's nearly an inevitability. I'd say modernism, uh, the early modernism was also too large. I mean, many of them was these these iconic villa projects, and 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 special projects were also part of part of that. 
So that's more of the battle I'm 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 playing. But we we then then it's hard to make the argument, or I'm almost stressing the universality of this approach, which really goes across, cuts across all straight uh, class boundaries, regional boundaries, you know, and adapts to different cultures in the world division of labor, paramedic regionalism we talked about. And we, we also addressing, you know, we can address and would address social housing. I criticize social housing for other reasons, but let's say low cost housing, you know, uh, which for instance, in one way to express itself nicely is, is, is co-living and such, such 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 projects so so that's for me more of the i mean it's another, let's say it's another frontier where i've been struggling to to overcome misrepresentation or misunderstanding i you know they don't think it's invented style they they, they, they think it's a sinister and insensitive and in unfair style thank you Patrick. A lot of energy, actually. We have yeah. uh, almost two hour and a half. <laughs> That's really oh long. Oh my god! Yeah, it's getting longer and longer each 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 yeah, session. Yeah. Each session gets yeah, longer. Actually, longer. we put everything on the uh, YouTube and Bidi Bidi, so uh, it's like uh, the knowledge uh, people can sharing and assembly in the future. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. So thank you, Sorry. thank you for today's uh, interesting discussion late uh, between some professors and students here. And we should wrap up because um, we have uh, Odili Deck uh, uh, interview tonight. And yeah, and I have an internal review with the, with the workshop actually, with the Metaverse workshop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Thank you so, so much. Continue. All right, good to see you yeah. guys.